the Philippine College of Physicians, I would like to thank them for the trust and privilege to co-present this project. Today would have been the PCP's 50th Annual Convention and Scientific Meeting. Nevertheless, the circumstances surrounding this health crisis had presented the PCP with new opportunities and innovations in the conduct of learning activities. This webinar is just the first of the series of sessions which PCP will host in partnership with the DOH. Each session will be presented by distinguished speakers who will share their knowledge and expertise in their fields. We hope you will join us in every session and that you will glean significant insights from it. Today we are honored to have with us Yusek Rosette Verhere and Director Beverly Hoff, the DOH, to present the general policies with regards to COVID-19 response. Thank you once again, and we hope you will enjoy the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Regina, for, for the opening remarks. So this is a series of webinars that is collaboration between the Department of Health and the Philippine College of Physicians. Um, um, basically, the webinars will be from Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 to 12, uh, 10 to 11.30 a.m. And our first, uh, first topic is the general principles of COVID-19 response. It is a privilege to introduce our first speaker. Um, Yusek Verheri is a current Undersecretary of Health and was previously Assistant Secretary in charge of the public public health services team. She previously served as director of the Health Facilities and Service, Services Regulatory Bureau and chief of the Health Research Division of the Health Policy Development and Planning Bureau. Under Secretary Verhere has committed decades to public service, having worked in Marikina City's health office before joining the Department of Health in 2007. She obtained her undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of Santo Tomas, her a medical degree from the De La Salle College, this De La Salle University College of Medicine, and her master's in public health from the University of the Philippines, Manila. To talk about the general principles of the COVID-19 response, let us all, it is a privilege. Uh, let us all welcome Yusek uh, uh, Rosette Verheri. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Debbie. Uh, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. I am representing the Secretary and the other members of today's uh, forum. Uh, we will just provide you with the general principles of our COVID-19 response for today. And in the next days after, we will be providing you with specific strategies as to laboratories, as to management, and hopefully, uh, all of us can align in what we do as we go through this uh, series of webinars. Uh, can we share the slide now, Kim? So as Dr. Adebi has mentioned, I am now with Dr. Beverly Ho. Uh, she is our director for our pub, uh, health promotions and communication service. And also we are joined by uh, some of the technical staff of DOH. So next slide, please. Uh, our presentation would include our strategic directions and then we'll go further to the case classification. As we all know, we, there was this revision that was done uh, a few weeks ago uh, whereby we have aligned with international classification standards already. The third would be case investigation, uh, highlighting on the different strategies that we do, uh, the same for detection and management. Next, please. Next slide, please. This slide would show you our guiding principles for what we call as the new normal. And uh, this slide uh, would show you our primary goal of our COVID-19 response, which is to reduce COVID-19 related and non-COVID-19 deaths. So in this slide, we are emphasizing that we just do not deal with this COVID-19 related uh, cases, but also has to 
uh, put emphasis on the non-COVID-19 cases as well. So you must be, um, all of you uh, must be in uh, line, uh, all of us should be aligned uh, with this goal of uh, both covering for COVID-19 and non-COVID cases. Under these two, two strategies are key critical action points that we must uh, be able to orchestrate uh, so that we can have this work. Our, our Buntu Usher in a New Normal is our five-point strategy, which is increasing resilience, stopping transmission, reducing contact rates, shortening duration of infectiousness, and the last would be enhancing quality, consistency, and affordability of care. These strategies are aligned with our national action plan to prevent, detect, isolate, and treat cases of COVID-19, which has been uh, the basis of our standards and our policies for this new normal that we talk about. Our guiding principles would be first, uh, that there would be this whole of government, whole of system, whole of society approach that's, that shall be espoused in the fight against COVID. So uh, this uh, would be meaning that all necessary sectors, uh, including uh, your society and the other medical society, are involved in our processes and will always be consulted. Evidence has steered and shall continue to direct our decision making from the institutional down to the individual levels. This shall ensure to an empowered Filipino able to make informed health choices to protect himself against COVID-19. We uh, emphasize on that fact that our re resources are limited and as such, we do prioritization. But in this prioritization, in any event that there would be conflict of rules or any of our guidelines, human dignity and safety and needs of the individual shall prevail. Next, please. So in flattening the curve, we have identified uh, these uh, basic principles that our response should be enabled by the national government, led by the local government units, and the principle of being people-centered should be at the heart of everything that we do. Next, please. So uh, we just want to uh, emphasize also that uh, there is this uh, evolving nature of this disease and uh, for this disease, science is evolving for this novel coronavirus. So as what we have said, we have changed our classifications about weeks ago, whereby we have aligned with the uh, international standards for reporting. And this has caused uh, a lot of issues across the different implementers. So just to emphasize that we have not, uh, as to management, we did not revise it uh, so much. Uh, it is just the... Uh, the, the terms that we have used so that we be aligned with international reporting. So we now have persons under monitoring. We have suspects, which are those uh, PUIs before and probable cases, PUIs also before, and the confirmed cases. Next, please. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we will show you... Uh, the important things that we remember when we classify a case. This is about having symptoms and having exposure. Before, travel history was, uh, was also significant, but as we have had these uh, restrictions in different borders, so we now are seeing uh, that the exposure is more significant as of this date. So we have uh, the first column with symptoms and with exposure, we'd find that those with symptoms and with exposure, we will be classifying whether it be a suspect, a probable, or a confirmed case. And for those without symptoms, but with exposure, they are our persons under monitoring. Next, please. Next, please with international standards and we know that this is an evolving uh, thing uh, for the novel coronavirus so we expect changes so this was one of the things that uh, uh, that we had explained uh, when people started reacting about our new case classification the primary implication in aligning 
to these international standards was about reporting so that we can be able to uh, be analyzed. Uh, our country will be analyzed together with the other countries because we have the same reporting uh, terminologies with international health regulations. But for management, it is still the same. Uh, we are still using the PISMID guide lines uh, for management and uh, classifications as to how we have used it before persons under monitoring is still there and the PUIs had been subclassified into two uh, namely the suspect cases and the probable cases next please. next slide please so as I've said, the case classification, our old classifications were just persons under monitoring and patients under investigation. For these new case definitions, we have added the suspects and the probable. So these suspect cases uh, would be those patients with histories of exposure, with symptoms, uh, those having uh, uh, influenza-like illnesses, uh, uh, those having uh, this SARS, uh, they, uh, but for testing, they are still awaiting results or they are still awaiting to be tested. So we will now classify them as suspect cases. And for probable cases, these are our suspected cases, but with inconclusive results, meaning their results might be equivocal as uh, released by our national or our laboratories and those used with a rapid antibody test and those people who really cannot be tested for whatever reason there is. And of course, our confirmed cases, which are our positive cases based on laboratory results. Next, please. Next slide. So for reporting purposes, we are just reporting the suspects, the probable, and the confirmed cases. The persons under monitoring, though, are not uh, reported anymore nationally and internationally still forms part of the significant reports that we get uh, coming from the local government, government unit. So we still report them locally and up to the regional offices. But for national and international reporting, we just include suspect, probable, and confirmed cases. Next, please. And for management purposes, this is uh, very important that everybody has to remember that persons under monitoring please us uh, is still part uh, of our uh, management of cases. And the persons under monitoring would be these close contacts of the suspects, of the probable, and the confirmed cases. For, so these different definitions for this classification is still part of our management of COVID-19 cases. Next, please. Next, please. So uh, the, this next slide would show you about our contact tracing. So how do we now determine what type or how a uh, tedious contact tracing should be in different uh, segments or in different situations that we are having right now? We have to remember that across the country, there are different scenarios. There are those uh, provinces which do not have cases at all. There are those provinces which are having sporadic cases, provinces which are having clustered cases currently, and there are areas in the Philippines which has already community transmission. So for those no cases, the preparation for contact tracing, of course, we assign the contact tracing team, and then there should be the necessary resources that would be assigned. For sporadic cases, uh, there should be rigorous contact tracing together with clustered cases. So we have to conduct active case finding and listing of all close contacts. We have to trace, we have to profile, and we have to assess all close contacts. And then, of course, we need to do testing for these high-risk close contacts based on our protocols of DOH for testing. And then we do community Transmission for contact tracing, we do continued contact tracing. We prioritize contact tracing in newly or lesser affected areas. We prioritize tracing on high-risk close, close contacts. And we synergize with other measures such as physical distancing. So these are the four, um, these are the four types uh, of how we can do contact tracing. So just to inform everybody uh, that we have already um, 
had an agreement with the Department of Interior and local government whereby they are already helping us with our contact tracing efforts. So uh, you would observe that in our structure, in our local government units for contact tracing, the head would be the municipal health office or the city health office, and then the co-lead would be our PNP in that specific locality or area. And the Barangay Health Emergency Response Teams, the BERTs, uh, would be the ones uh, that are being mobilized to do the contact tracing. Next, please. Next slide. So this is just for uh, the data that we are managing uh, especially now that we have this COVID-19 and a lot of issues are being raised, uh, most especially with the aspect of confidentiality. We are finding different LGUs uh, implementing different uh, management of data uh, to the extreme that some LGUs are really posting specific details of the patient. So just for us to all uh, be aware of our access level, what data can we share, what is the scope, and what should be the purpose. So in this slide, you'd find uh, these different uh, components of our data privacy and how we can uh, better share information without violating our data privacy act. So uh, all identified close contacts uh, shall be assigned anonymized identification for the purpose of information sharing or data analysis. Um, ma, you would observe that we are tagging our patients with patient numbers and we are not releasing their names because this is not allowed uh, based on the data privacy law. Uh, only relevant information to contact tracing shall be collected. The DOH reserves the right to release information on COVID-19 patients that are relevant for public health interventions without full disclosure of the patient's identity. And even in our Republic Act 11223, this is the Republic Act for Notifiable Diseases, one of the specific provisions in that, in that act would state that um, information would just be shared to uh, local officials for the purpose of public health, meaning for the purpose of contact tracing, for the purpose of profiling. Uh, so that's one of the things that we base our policies and standards with. The DOH and other government agencies involved contributing to the contact tracing shall form a memorandum of agreement on data sharing to ensure proper use and accountability of personal information being collected. So this is one of the requirements in the data privacy law that whenever DOH will be sharing uh, personal details of our patients to any agency, we need to have a data sharing agreement. The Epidemiology Bureau of DOH shall be the personal information controller who will be responsible for directing all actions related to data including the use of personal information needed for the conduct of COVID-19 response activities, such as contact tracing. And of course, the RESU or the Regional Epidemiologic Surveillance Unit, the LESU or the Local Government Surveillance Unit, and deputized agencies shall be personal information processors and shall be responsible for assigning a data protection officer and data protection controls, such as privacy and breach management. Next, please. So this is for case detection. Uh, for case detection, we all now know uh, that we are using both the rapid uh, antibody test and, of course, our gold standard of the RT-PCR-based test. So we now have a total of 23 laboratories licensed to do RT-PCR tests. And we now have a total of, I think, uh, 32 or 34 registered FDA, no? registered through FDA rapid antibody test. As to validation, our ITM and FDA are still on the process of doing these validations for our rapid antibody test. So uh, just to give you uh, this uh, slide where we differentiate uh, the RT-PCR from the rapid antibody test, as to its use and as to uh, the qualified personnel who can do this. So for example, uh, the basic difference no, uh, for these two tests 
for RT-PCR, we get our OPS and our NPS. And for, of course, the rapid antibody test, we all know it's through a blood sample. It's serology-based. The test sites, uh, both tests cannot be purchased from a drugstore. So it cannot be provided through over-the-counter um, distributors or retailers. It has to be in a facility. And um, the test site for RT-PCR is our specialized laboratories, the licensed laboratories. And for rapid antibody test, uh, it has to be done in a health facility or a hospital or maybe an RHU. For the evaluators, only licensed and trained health workers are supposed to be administering and interpreting these results. And specific to our DOH issuance, it should only be a licensed physician who can interpret the results of the rapid antibody test. The qualified persons who can uh, be subjected to RT-PCR would be those persons with or without symptoms. So, uh, meaning it can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. For rapid antibody tests, it, uh, as we all understand uh, how it works, it should only be given or administered to persons with symptoms and that those symptoms has to be qualified that it started no or uh, after the onset of symptoms it's the fifth to the 21st day upon first sign of symptoms it is now being used based on our protocol with our returning overseas filipino workers and also for those healthcare workers which we have uh, identified as having unprotected exposure the release period for RT-PCR is uh, 24 to 48 hours, including all the different processes that it undertakes or undergoes. And the rapid antibody test is within 15 minutes, you get your results. The purpose of the RT-PCR is for us to detect the virus genetic material as compared with the rapid antibody test that it detects our antibodies which are formed in our body, which is a possible reaction to COVID-19 infection. So for diagnosing, we do not use rapid antibody tests. So it is written in all of our policies that we do not use the rapid antibody test for our detection or for our diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. Because I know everybody knows here that it is prone to false positive and false negative results. Uh, for for RT-PCR, we use it for symptomatic individuals because uh, due to the limited capacity uh, of our resources, so we have identified priority individuals which would be tested. And the viral load of symptomatic individuals, we all know are high enough to render results accurate. Uh, those uh, using RT-PCR are subject to repeat testing if the patient tests negative and the results were sent. So uh, less priority compared to those who have not been tested. So next, please. Next slide. <clears throat> so for case detection, uh, for the use of the RT-PCR and for everybody's information, this is our subgroups of our patients for our prioritization list. If you would uh, see in this slide, you'd find uh, the slide that we had a little while ago where we had the exposures and the symptoms and classifying our patients as to suspects, probable and confirmed, and those persons under monitoring. Now in this slide, using the same table, we are now doing our prioritization. Uh, so with this, we have high priority groups and we have low priority subgroups. But it doesn't mean that if the individuals belong to the low priority that they will not be managed anymore. So for our subgroup A and subgroup B, this has been our priority from the start of our response. Subgroup A would include patients or healthcare workers with severe or critical symptoms and has relevant history of exposure and travel. For subgroup B, these are our patients or healthcare workers with mild symptoms has relevant history of travel and exposure, and also are considered as part of our vulnerable group. So this is, these are our elderly people, those patients with pre-existing conditions, and those uh, patients who have uh, high, uh, high risk pregnant women, 
and also our healthcare workers are considered as vulnerable vulnerable group as well. For our subgroup C, these are these are our mild asim, uh, these are our mild symptomatics. So patients or healthcare workers with mild symptoms and has relevant history of travel and uh, contact or exposure. And the subgroup D would be the asymptomatics but with history of travel and contact. Now, in our expanded testing guidelines, we have included as priority still our subgroups A and B. And included in that guideline, specifically, we mentioned that subgroup C would be tested once our testing capacity reaches 8,000 tests per day. And subgroup D would be included once our, uh, our capacity for testing reaches more than 8,000 tests per day. So this was, these were the specific uh, provisions that we have provided in our protocols for expanded testing. Next, please. So for also for this specific uh, rapid antibody test, uh, we have emphasized in our policies that only licensed medical doctors may request and administer these antibody-based test kits. But on the ground, as we received the feedback, there were um, requests that if a licensed uh, healthcare professionals can also administer the antibody-based uh, antibody test kits. So it would be up to the facility on how they are going to do it as long as it would be the licensed medical doctor who's going to interpret the results of this rapid antibody test. So for the rapid antibody test, we still require appropriate PPEs uh, that would be used by those who are administering these uh, test kits. They have to follow the protocols of DOH in how we use the rapid antibody test. They have to issue the results of the rapid antibody test to DOH because we already have now a database for those being tested with rapid antibody tests. Next, please. So for case detection, we have these uh, strategies that we use for scaling up testing capacity in the country. The first is maximizing capacity of existing independent subnational laboratories. If you would remember, we started off with this uh, response uh, as we only had our ITM as our sole laboratory to do the testing for COVID-19. We started off with only having 300 tests per day as output. Right now, we already have 23 testing centers licensed by um, licensed by DOH, and we have an average capacity per day of about 5,300 tests per day. So what would we do for us to attain the 8,000 tests per day goal, and now the longer term goal uh, based from the recent pronouncements of 30,000 tests per day at the end of May? First strategy is to maximize or optimize capacity of our existing independent subnational laboratories. So what we are going to do is augment uh, their health human resources, add uh, machines, RTPR machines, add equipments, biosafety cabinets, automated extraction machines, so that we can extend the operating hours of our subnational laboratories and also increase their capacity. With this, if we can do that, we can reach the maximum capacity of each of our subnational laboratories, which we have computed alongside with them. By doing this, by optimizing the capacity, we have aimed to reach about 7,500 to 8,000 tests per day. If we can fulfill and finish the maximization of the capacity of our existing subnational laboratories. The second would be certifying more or licensing more subnational labs towards independent testing. Currently, aside from the 23 laboratories that we have, there is still about 48 laboratories which are waiting for their licenses. Uh, uh, among this um, waiting for their licenses, about 35 or 38 laboratories are in the stages three and stage four of being licensed by DOH. So how do we do this? 
We have created additional teams for licensing. We now have eight teams to license and certify these different laboratories. It's a composite team composed of the licensing group of DOH, uh, together with the RITM experts, together with WHO, and we have already uh, uh, recruited volunteers from the Department of Science and Technology and from the University of the Philippines. Uh, we are asking for volunteers also for molecular biologists and accredited biosafety officers so that they can also join us in our inspection. The strategy would be that they would have assigned priority regions and within those assigned areas, they have to uh, focus on these different facilities, provide them with technical assistance, and they are given two weeks to be able to help these facilities to be licensed um, for all of these stage three and stage four uh, facilities that are waiting to be licensed. So these are 38 in all. So we can be able to add the capacity of all of these uh, to our existing 23 if and when by uh, within those two weeks, we can be able to license all of them. These priority regions would be regions two, region three, region 4A, region seven, region eight, region nine, region 10, region 12, and uh, the Caraga region. So these regions were identified based on the number of cases, the clustering of cases, and also because they have, do not have access uh, to our subnational laboratories or the COVID testing centers. The third strategy would be establishing big testing centers or the modular laboratories in strategic areas around the country. So we already have started with this. If uh, all of you, I think, knows about our JBL or the Jose Bilingad Hospital, where we have partnered with our uh, with ADB. And this center promises to produce 3,000 tests per day. So we now have this TF3, this task force uh, TF3, uh, which is a partnership with the private sector whereby we are partnering with big uh, institutions and firms from the private sector. Uh, they are helping us right now to ramp up our testing capacity to be able to reach the 30,000 goal by May 30. Uh, the first of uh, the things that they have done uh, is the, the modular laboratories. They are already constructing six to be uh, placed in different strategic areas of the country. And aside from that, they are also looking at investing in big testing centers in Visayas and Mindanao. Aside from these laboratories that they will be establishing, they also are helping us right now with the supplies of our different laboratories because we all know there is international shortage. There is also a national shortage of the supplies that we use for testing. They are now helping us source out. They are now helping us have these uh, specific lines, open lines with other countries so that we can access the supplies faster and uh, it can uh, solve the existing operational issues of our subnational laboratories. The fourth would be other testing approaches for continuing expansion. Uh, best example for this would be our gene expert laboratories. Initially, we have prepared 19 facilities to become our gene expert laboratories. Unfortunately, we like to temper the expectations of people because the certainty of the supply of cartridges uh, have not been uh, no assurance yet. So we already have received an initial 15,000 worth or 15,000 cartridges. So uh, this had been already uh, distributed to our different facilities needing it the most. We have to use this uh, 15,000 for us to supplement areas which doesn't have RT-PCR and also those facilities that we have right now, uh, which are having a hard time uh, doing the RT-PCR and catering to all of these uh, assigned areas and facilities uh, that were assigned to their facilities or laboratories. Next, please. So for case detection in summary, 14-day isolation is still mandatory regardless of results. What's happening right now is a, a lot of uh, practitioners or even in the community 
uh, they are relying uh, very, uh, they are relying mostly on the test before they can do action. So what we recommend is even if we are still awaiting results, even if the tests are not there or cannot do the test, the 14-day isolation is very important, irregardless if you have tested or not. RT-PCR is still our gold standard for diagnosing cases. And the rapid antibody test is only used uh, for specific instances or situations as based from our protocol. Like for those recovering, we can already discharge pati patients in our hospitals who are clinically recovered uh, using our rapid antibody test so that we can be able to decongest our hospitals. Same with our quarantine facilities. If they already have finished the 14-day quarantine um, period, they can be tested with a rapid antibody test so that there could be a more or less a basis for discharging a patient. And then mass testing, let me remind everybody, does not mean testing for everybody. That It doesn't mean also uh, it can be uh, done uh, doing indiscriminate testing. Mass testing is expanded testing as what I have explained to you, all of you a while ago where we include the different subgroups of priorities of the Department of Health. Next, please. So we go now to case management. So uh, we have principles for managing cases, uh, isolation, quarantine, and the different facilities that we have like the TTMF or the temporary treatment and monitoring facilities, our community isolation units, and of course, our COVID referral and accepting hospitals. Next, please. So for this case management principles, very first on top of the list would be our principle of minimizing face-to-face -face contact with our patients so that we can prevent further transmission of the disease. So now we promote telemedicine. We have accredited several telemedicine um, providers already, uh, they already have started, and uh, this is our initial interaction with our families or our patients. The second line of, uh, the first line of defense, as we see in this slide, of course, would be our individuals and households. They have to do the personal protective measures or the non-pharmaceutical in, uh, interventions, uh, such as routine disinfection, hand hygiene, cough etiquette. And of course, uh, we also do physical distancing in our households as well. For our second line of defense, of course, we have our primary care providers. So these primary care providers would include our RHUs, our outpatient clinics, and our main actors would be our barangay health emergency response teams, our barangay health workers, and of course, our general practitioners or our primary care uh, doctors. So with the, all of this, uh, the third line of defense are our facilities, of course. We have our hospitals and of course we have our uh, quarantine facilities, the TTMFs and the step-down care facilities that we have. And all of these are tied with this referral network. It should be that there should be this organization among our provinces, uh, organized by our provinces and cities, and they should organize uh, their healthcare provider network, and it has to be linked to our regional hospitals and our subnational laboratories. Next, please. So for isolation and quarantine, we also are using this table uh, for exposures and symptoms and so that we can have a better grasp of the continuing uh, case detection to management. So for those with symptoms and with exposure, and we all know these are our suspects, are probable in our confirmed cases, uh, we have this isolation uh, form of management where it needs medical attention, there is symptomatic management, and medical personnel are monitoring our patients. So this can be our hospitals. And for those without symptoms but with exposure, we do our quarantine. It needs monitoring to take action if ever there would be progression of symptoms. And of course, we like to ensure restricted movement and they are monitored by our non-medical personnel or the Barangay Health Emergency Response Team. So there are two uh, major uh, components of our managing of cases. This is isolating and quarantining. Next, please. 
So for our facilities based on isolation and quarantine, we have three types of facilities. The first one would be our local government unit facilities. These are our LIGTAS COVID centers. And uh, we have also our mega facilities here in the National Capital Region. These are our mega facilities for COVID-19. And then, of course, we have our step-down care uh, or the COVID-19 level one hospitals, which are our district hospitals. So with all of this, uh, for the local government, uh, these uh, the COVID LIGTA centers in our local governments, we can admit person under monitoring, suspects, probable or confirmed. Also with our mega health facilities in the national capital region, we are prioritizing those confirmed positive with mild and asymptomatic cases. Uh, those who are suspect or probable has to be has to have uh, separate rooms with individual toilets and showers because we cannot mix them uh, with those already confirmed because they have not been tested yet. In cases where these uh, COVID LIGTA centers or mega facilities cannot provide separate rooms or separate toilets, the bed should be one meter apart on all sides. The toilet and the shower facility should be used based on schedules and it has to be disinfected after use. And for cohorting, we can already cohort those confirmed positive patients. So for our step-down care, these are for our recovering confirmed cases because as we uh, all know, those positive cases who had been admitted to hospitals or quarantine facilities, after their 14th day in the hospital or quarantine facility, they are still required to undergo another 14 days of quarantine period. That's why it was, um, uh, it was uh, recommended no, and implemented that we have this step-down care because a lot of our uh, citizens do not have their own rooms and do not have their own toilets in their houses. Next, please. So uh, just to give you the difference between a COVID referral and a COVID accepting hospital. The COVID referral hospital uh, is uh, really dedicated no, for these uh, COVID uh, cases. It's a closed routine hospital service for non-COVID cases except ER for the entire hospital selected building, uh, buildings committed to discharge or transfer all admitted stable patients after designation to accommodate confirmed, probable, and suspected COVID-19 patients in coordination with partner facilities. So this is what happened to PGH at the start. So they were designated as COVID-19 referral hospital, but when they were designated, they still had patients under their care. So slowly they transitioned and they were able to partner with other institutions and they were able to refer these patients who are non-COVID to other hospitals uh, within the same or within the Metro Manila. So, uh, there is this COVID-19 accepting hospitals which prioritize non-COVID patients. But they accept and manage suspect, probable, and confirmed uh, for emergency care only. And admission of COVID-19 patients depends on the capacity also of hospitals. So uh, these COVID referral hospitals would uh, mostly be our levels 2 and our level 3 hospitals. Next, please. So just to show you the pathway of cases for our COVID, uh, we have, as I've said, we like to make uh, emphasis no, uh, that we have also our non-COVID-19 patient pathway. So everything starts with the families and individuals who will be needing uh, health care. They, they have to go through telemedicine. We encourage them to go uh, to go through telemedicine uh, provider so that uh, we can lessen the risk of being infected. So based on the advice of the telemedicine providers, they can either go to the COVID-19 patient pathway or to the non-COVID-19 patient pathway. So for COVID-19 patient pathway, our main navigator for the services would be our Barangay Health Emergency Response Team. Uh, if it is a COVID-related case, they can be referred to our temporary treatment and monitoring facilities with individual rooms and toilets for the probable uh, mild, the suspect mild, or the person under monitoring. These are our LICTAS COVID-19 centers in our LGUs. Or they can be 
uh, refer to our TTMF with cohorting. These are our confirmed mild or asymptomatic cases in our mega facilities here in NCR and in Luzon. Or they can be referred already to our COVID-19 referral hospitals if their symptoms are severe. And uh, they can also be referred to our step-down care facilities if they are already recovering confirmed uh, cases. So for those non-COVID-19 patients, they will be referred and navigated by a barangay health worker. Of course, it starts with our primary care facilities and can be referred to, a, to our higher level facilities if needed. Next, please. So just to give you the clinical definitions of uh, recovery, so uh, for recovering still with symptoms, uh, those there are individuals which are already who are already recovering but still with symptoms. Uh, it can already be they can already be referred to our lower level facility like a step down facility or a temporary treatment monitoring facility upon clearance by the attending physician. This is just so if the patient is already stable and the objective of which is for us to decongest hospitals. For uh, the next one would be those clinically recovered, meaning they do not have any more symptoms at all. They can be discharged without tests and sent to a step-down facility or a temporary treatment and management or and monitoring facility, or they can be sent home if they have the necessary or they have their own uh, rooms and toilets upon clearance by the attending physician. They have to have another 14 days for all of these recovering patients. For those fully recovered, we tag them as recovered in our database if they already have completed their 14-day facility or home-based isolation after being admitted in the hospital and have already undergone tests and they were negative for RT-PCR or positive for IgG in the rapid antibody test. And then, of course, reintegration into the community. A certificate is being issued by our local government units or our quarantine medical officers, and it will be facilitated by our Barangay Health Emergency Response Teams. Next, please. So just to summarize, uh, for case management, <clears throat> we have our isolation and our quarantine principles and protocols. And our principle or our main uh, protocol would be it should be the facility first. So um, we try to determine if they have this uh, room and uh, separate toilets in their houses, but uh, we are encouraging that it should be that a patient should be brought to the facility instead of staying home because there are a lot of breaches when it is being done, the quarantine is being done in their homes. For the purposes of field health payment, uh, the temporary treatment and monitoring facilities is equivalent with our community isolation units. And on facility standards, cohort if confirmed. So all positive cases can be mixed and can be in one room. Individual rooms with toilets should be, if it is just person under monitoring, those suspects, those probable, because these people have not been tested yet and you cannot mix them with other patients. Next, please. So for the last slide, just to show you the benefits from PhilHealth. So for testing, PhilHealth offers um, this PhilHealth package amount. If testing was not paid for by DOH and the test kit used was not donated, PhilHealth can reimburse 8,150 pesos per test. If testing was not paid for by DOH but the test kit was donated, PhilHealth will be reimbursing 5,450 pesos per test. If testing was paid for by DOH and the test kit used was donated, PhilHealth shall be paying 2,710 per test. For community-based management or our TTMF or the community isolation units, PhilHealth shall be reimbursing 22,449 per isolation cycle meaning for this 14 days or more uh, that patients become quarantined. Uh, and then for hospital-based management, we have our uh, COVID-19 level one field hospitals and of course our COVID-19 referral hospitals. So PhilHealth will be reimbursing uh, 
on uh, these different uh, levels of pneumonia, severity of pneumonia, mild pneumonia, moderate and severe. Also, PhilHealth likes everybody to know that all the other um, cases or diseases that uh, might be with the patient or the patient will present with shall be covered through the existing case rates. So these um, monies that will be uh, reimbursed from PhilHealth uh, can be used for these different purposes uh, on the third column of this slide. So I think that's the last of my slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yusek Rosette, uh, for that comprehensive uh, lecture on what DOH is doing. Uh, before we go to the questions, uh, we are privileged actually to present to you the Secretary of Health, um, Dr. Francisco Duque III. Uh, so while we're waiting for Secretary, um, the Q&A portion, as you can see, some of your questions were answered already by the team from DOH. Um, and then if we, we don't have time anymore, you can actually email your questions to zoom.pcp at gmail.com and we will answer your questions. You said Rosette. So basically, majority of the questions are on rapid testing. You've already tackled those as well. Uh, and then most of the answered the answered questions are basically uh, already here. I can read some of them. So what is the definition of exposure? We see positive COVID patients with no known contact with COVID probable cases. So you can read on the DOH revised interim guidelines on expanded testing for COVID-19. I think uh, the resource is also already there. Face-to-face uh, -face contact with a confirmed case within one meter and for more than 15 minutes. Direct physical contact with the confirmed case. Direct care for a patient uh, with probable or confirmed COVID-19 disease without using proper PPE, history of travel to a community with local transmission of COVID-19. Uh, basically, the, the team of DOH, they already actually answered some of your questions and they have um, the algorithm as well as the resources where you can get that, those. Yusek, Yusek. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we already have tried to answer uh, some of the questions that were uh, provided to us. And also, our team is uh, currently looking You're on at... Mute. Uh, I... You're on mute. Yes. Can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, we have tried to answer uh, the questions already... Uh, provided to us and uh, some of the questions in the Q&A uh, chat box, I think, uh, are being answered by our team uh, who has joined us uh, today in this forum. So if uh, we will not be able to answer some of them, we will be sending uh, through, uh, through email uh, the different uh, answers to the questions that will be posted. Okay, ma'am. So I think uh, Secretary Duque is ready for uh, for his short message to all of us. So we're privileged um, to have with us our hardworking Secretary of Health, Dr. Francisco Duque III. Uh, Doctor, yes, ma'am. Yes, you said. Uh, yes, I think the secretary is still uh, talking uh, with somebody for a while. Uh, maybe we can answer some of the questions uh, first, uh, if there are still any. Uh, there are a lot of questions here, ma'am. But I think 
the uh, Dr. Amora uh, from PCP um, is asking where do we get RT-PCR results within 24 to 48 hours. I think they're from Quezon City. She's a doctor from Quezon City uh, because at present, the average turnaround time, I don't know if this is correct in Quezon City is two weeks. Uh, Secretary Duque is already there, ma'am. Secretary Duque, you have the floor. Uh, in, uh, on behalf of uh, the DOH and the Interagency Task Force, I'd like to uh, greet all of you a uh, most, uh, most uh, pleasant uh, day. And uh, the, uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, congratulations uh, to the group uh, for uh, coming together um, um, to discuss the physician's uh, webinar on the general principles of uh, the uh, COVID-19 response. And uh, Dr. Uh, Maria Ging Nazareth is the uh, president of the. Uh, yeah, Maria Gina Nazareth. Okay, is she uh, around? Dr. Uh, Nazareth, are you around? Secretary Duque, she's on Facebook Live. So. Uh, on Facebook she's Live. Around. Yeah. She's okay. watching. Yeah, so my greetings uh, to uh, the uh, Philippine College of Physicians uh, officers and uh, your uh, members as well. Now, uh, the DOH uh, is just one of the mechanisms uh, that uh, it uh, would like to solicit the support uh, of the uh, Philippine College of Physicians or PCP as a valuable partner in this war against COVID-19. And we thank the uh, PCP for providing scientific leadership um, at this time of the crisis. This webinar is just one of the mechanisms for us to ensure the entire medical community is aligned in every step of the way. And I'd like to also use this opportunity to thank the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Incorporated, or the PISME, uh, specifically for ensuring that most up-to-date evidence-based clinical practice guidelines are available for all of us. And this unified efforts have proven essential to our COVID-19 response efforts. And so the DOH looks forward to more meaningful collaborations in these coming weeks, uh, if not uh, coming months. So together, uh, I call upon uh, each one of you to uh, support the national government in uh, beating this uh, scourge uh, of the 21st century and uh, COVID-19 uh, must be crushed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Duque, uh, for gracing this webinar. Uh, thank you for all your efforts in fighting COVID-19. And we at the Philippine College of Physicians, um, are, we're honored to, to be part of, of, of this webinar and the fight against COVID-19. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Secretary. So we are actually um, looking through the questions that our doctors, dear doctors from all over the Philippines are asking. Um, I can direct the question to you, Sec uh, Rosette, or to Secretary Duque, but the question um, that they've asked, uh, may I know how, this is from Dr. Elmer Garcia, May I know how the validation is done? Do we have a timeline as to when these validation studies will be available to public? I think they're referring to the rapid antibody testing. Zach, you like me to answer? Uh, you're yeah, on mute, po kayo, Sec. Secretary, you're on mute, po. Yeah, so I'm now uh, unmuted. So uh, uh, after my response, I would like to call upon uh, uh, Yusek uh, Vergeri 
to give us the latest update vis-a-vis -vis the validation efforts of third party uh, agencies or institutions of uh, the various FDA approved rapid antibody testing kits. But what I know uh, as of last week, I think the uh, DOST uh, uh, through the PCHRD are uh, now uh, touching base or have begun touching base with uh, RITM for uh, validation of uh, some of the test kits that have been approved or certified by the FDA, uh, which will uh, eventually be used uh, by uh, the national uh, government. Uh, and uh, that's uh, how far uh, I know. Uh, I don't know uh, the nitty gritty uh, or the details of uh, how many uh, validation uh, uh, have been uh, done uh, in terms of uh, numbers. So I'd like to call upon uh, uh, you, Secretary Jerry, to uh, add on to my uh, to the information that I just shared. Yes, uh, thank you, Sec. Uh, the validation uh, for the rapid antibody test. Uh, last week, the Food and Drug Administration communicated to us that uh, they already have formed this uh, team uh, with the RITM. Uh, the team coming from FDA are also laboratory personnel so that they can start with the validation of the rapid antibody test kits that we have. Apparently, uh, with this validation uh, for this test uh, would take time. And uh, they are soon to start uh, based from their report uh, last week uh, with the validation of these 34 test kits already registered with the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, that's, that, that was our report from last week, uh, sir. Thank you, Secretary Newsek. Um, Secretary, are you still uh, okay to answer a few sure. questions? Sure, sure, to the best that I can. Okay. Thank you. The second question, um, since local, I think this is um, the question in everybody's mind, since local transmission is still occurring in our country, in some areas of our country, would it be safe to assume that everyone with relevant symptoms becomes a suspect? I, yes, that is my uh, position. In fact, uh, the, uh, find, uh, isolate, and test uh, sequence of uh, activities uh, must be supported uh, rather than the test uh, trace and treat. Uh, to emphasize that this is not just all about testing, the narrative ought to move from the testing centricity that is uh, in the mind of uh, many uh, to really uh, elevate the importance of uh, active case finding uh, and uh, isolation uh, or quarantine uh, if asymptomatic, and then to test and then treat uh, uh, active cases. So this is uh, what I think ought to be done in the next uh, a uh, few days, uh, we have to really give equal, if not greater importance to uh, finding and then uh, isolating and then testing and uh, treating. Thank you. Do you say, Chris, Ed? Yeah. Yes, Doctor, uh, uh, we support uh, whatever uh, the secretary is mentioning is our current direction uh, for this uh, response that we are having right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Doctora, I just like to recognize we also have our experts from our technical advisory group who are also here. Uh, if ever there would be uh, some questions, uh, maybe be able to refer to them as well. So the technical uh, group uh, is also a member of the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Society of Microbiology Infectious Diseases, Dr. Edsel Salvagna and Dr. Isa Alejandria. So there's a third question from Dr. Chao Sevilla. She's a cardiologist. Many private organizations and subdivisions are beginning to offer rapid testing kits. 
for IgG to their members. Is this a good idea? Will this not increase the possibility of false negatives and possibly lead to complacency in preventive behaviors, which will in turn result in a subsequent rise in the incidence of infection? So I direct the question to anybody who can answer it. Please. Yeah, ma ma yeah if I may, uh, yeah, you're right. I, I, I agree with you. It can lead to uh, complacency, uh, you know, uh, false, uh, you know, sense of uh, security. And uh, that is something that uh, we should not be uh, uh, contributing to. So our gold standard remains, which is the uh, RT-PCR. Uh, however, um, the IATF has uh, agreed to use the uh, rapid antibody testing uh, for those who have undergone quarantine uh, and in the cohorts uh, of uh, the sea-based and the land-based uh, OFWs. Uh, uh, so there is a, an algorithm. We will be very glad to uh, provide you with the algorithm uh, how this uh, should be applied, but very carefully applied. Uh, uh, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you said Crosette, if the subgroup B uh, of uh, those uh, we have prioritized, meaning this is the last uh, uh, of uh, those that ought to be tested, uh, and if we're not yet able to uh, sufficiently uh, test with uh, RT-PCR, in other words, uh, if we haven't reached the uh, 8,000 uh, daily testing outputs, uh, then the subgroup D, which means uh, these are uh, asymptomatic uh, uh, patients uh, who have had no history of uh, travel uh, and uh, uh, exposure. Uh, asymptomatic, and therefore, if we do not uh, test them, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, they are actually patients uh, or healthcare workers with no symptoms, but indeed relevant history of uh, travel and uh, contact, okay? Uh, once we have reached the daily testing capacity beyond 8,000, uh, then we can include them for rapid, uh, for uh, RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase uh, PCR tests. However, while we haven't uh, reached that output, uh, they may actually be tested using the rapid uh, antibody uh, testing kits with, again, our algorithm uh, and, uh, and conditions, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's our position. I agree that uh, we shouldn't be uh, just cavalierly uh, encourage uh, the use, uh, less this is imprudent, uh, the use of rapid antibody testing uh, kits, just, you know, for, for everybody else. Thank you, Secretary. Yes, uh, Doctor. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, uh, what uh, the Secretary has mentioned uh, is correct, no? Yun po yung nakalagay sa protocol natin. Uh, but can we hear the science of it uh, from our expert, Dr. Edsel Salvania? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, in terms of uh, using the antibody test kit for clearing people, um, uh, first of all, I think the one thing that everyone has to take into consideration is there is no good test for an asymptomatic carrier. Um, so in other words, uh, your antibody test for asymptomatic carriers um, will most likely be negative because your antibody, uh, it hasn't had a chance to make antibody yet. A lot of these asymptomatics are actually pre-symptomatic and they will develop symptoms in about two to three days. And it usually takes about seven days of symptoms before you develop any kind of antibody test. So if you're looking for asymptomatic carriers, you're not going to find them uh, using an antibody test. 
for RT-PCR, um, you can find pre-symptomatics about two to three days before they manifest symptoms. So the better test if you're looking for asymptomatic um, uh, carriers is actually RT-PCR. But we already know that even in symptomatic, RT-PCR um, is only going to be positive in about two-thirds of them if you're going to use a nasopharyngeal swab. In other words, you're going to miss one-third of those who actually do have disease uh, because of the nature of the sampling. And this is going to be even more in terms of who you will miss um, if you use, uh, if you're testing uh, pre-symptomatics because the viral load tends to be lower. What, what is the bottom line? Um, you will, there is no way you can rule out asymptomatic carriage of, um, of, of COVID-19 in anyone and uh, you, you cannot use uh, RDTs for that definitely. And RT-PCR is also imperfect and may only detect maybe half of them. So the bottom line is your default is, alam mo nang may makakalusot talaga kahit anong gawin mo. So the best way to do it is to be proactive. The testing can inform you, but the more important action point is to always take, uh, is to always treat anybody as a potential asymptomatic transmitter. So always yung uh, six feet, uh, three to six feet distance, universal mask wearing, you can do the testing uh, in a sampling fashion, say if you're going to start work and you want to see if there are asymptomatics there, you can make a small sample of people, you can do RT-PCR on them. I don't know who's going to pay for it, but they're asymptomatic. But the bottom line is um, using antibody tests to screen for asymptomatic carriers is not going to work. Um, you can use them after 14 days to see if somebody developed disease, but as an initial test, uh, it's not going to work. Thank you. I think Edsel, I um, the over the the question in everyone everybody's mind because we have doctors who are um, uh, doctors of companies, and they're being asked by their employers how do they actually screen the employees that will go back to work. I think that's why um, it's it, it it we have to have a clear message on how to do this because some uh, would be doing rapid antibody testing in their asymptomatic persons as a screening tool prior to returning back to work after the lifting of the ECQ. Um, but you've said that it's not going to work. So I think um, will DOH and DOLE give out guidelines for return to work for employees? Yeah, I think the very important, the first screening step you should always do is a symptomatic screen. Has anybody had fever and respiratory symptoms in the last 14 days? And so those are the people that you can already exclude. And if you exclude them, you actually get rid of 80% of people who can potentially transmit. So the only ones that you have to worry about are the 20% potential transmitters uh, na makakalusot sa symptom screen mo. And you should keep doing the symptom screen every day. Now, for those asymptomatic na, na carriers na that will account for the 20% that can potentially transmit, um, you know, you can do sampling. But again, even if you blanket test all of them, you will miss about half of them anyway. And that is why you have to engineer your workplace in such a way that you can mitigate that transmission. And so whether you want to do blanket testing or you want to do sampling, um, may makakalusot pa rin. So sa akin, mas cost-effective if you do sampling lang. So um, I think there's another question. We have time for one to two questions. Um, from Dr. Um, Santos Cow, testing backlog is said to be currently around 8,000. Results are released as long as two weeks from sample collection. Example, a swab taken in April 16, release, result released and reported on April 29. This obscures the picture regarding the trend of new infection. I think what they want to ask it is, is there, 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 what is being done about this with regards to the backlog of testing? Maybe Yusek uh, Rousset can uh, talk more about it uh, because the measures are uh, being put in place 
have already actually uh, reduced the uh, uh, backlog. So, uh, Rosette, uh, can you give the numbers uh, more clearly uh, to everyone? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have identified this 8,000 backlog uh, one and a half weeks ago. And we already have done measures uh, for us to be able to reduce these backlogs. Actually, uh, our ITM with this 8,000 had initially uh, had 2,500 backlogs. Uh, UPNIH had 1,300. And the other subnational laboratories also had their share of backlogs. So when we have identified uh, this issue, uh, we did some zoning and some transferring of assigned uh, areas uh, to other laboratories to unburden those with backlogs. Also asking the help of the Philippine Red Cross uh, for us to reduce backlogs further and also have uh, asked the help of our private uh, partners uh, which uh, have created this team, the Task Force T3, if you have heard of it. These are big private corporations which are now uh, helping the department and the government in ramping up capacity. So when uh, one of the issues uh, was about uh, the supplies uh, in uh, our subnational laboratories, private sector was there to immediately help us uh, to fulfill or to uh, provide the supplies that we needed so that uh, we can be able to manage the daily operations of our laboratories. We are not saying that we do not have backlogs currently, uh, but these backlogs already have been reduced uh, from the once 8,000. Uh, there is still backlog, but not that much anymore. And we are still trying to continue to work with other uh, institutions like the Philippine Red Cross for us to be able to further reduce the backlogs. Thank you, Yusek. So our, our last question, um, from uh, Marie Manabat, regarding contact tracing, how close are we to using smartphone apps to assist us in providing data as to the locations visited by a COVID positive case and his positive co possible contacts like what is utilized in other countries like Singapore, exa for example? So, uh, Dr. Ra, can I ask Dr. Beverly Ho to uh, give us the response to that? Bev? Yes, Doc. Uh, I'll read the question again, Bev. Uh, regarding contact tracing, how close are we to using smartphone apps to assist us in providing data as to the locations visited by a COVID positive case and his possible contacts like what is utilized in other countries like Singapore? The OCV, um, which is the head of the National Task Force, has already um, approved um, certain contact tracing apps. I think um, advertisements have already been put out for that. Um, efforts are being undertaken po to link all of them to the EPI database. Um, so the IATF has already um, instructed the formation of a sub-TWG for ICT because a lot of these um, solutions have been put out but not necessarily um, all coordinated. No? So, they don't all link up to the EPI database. So that's um, that's all for now, ma'am. So we are taking note of all of the questions and we'll provide an answer sheet for the unanswered uh, and future questions to so the emails provided in the pre-registration. Um, DOH um, can be, they have a lot of platforms where you can ask questions, right? Uh, there, there's Viber, uh, there's Facebook, there's email. So they're, they've been reaching out to everybody so that all of the things that they're doing, um, all of us will know uh, what the direction of DOH is. So uh, we'd like to have a few words from both USEC Rosette and Secretary Duque before we close the session. Um, I, anybody can... Oh, okay, let me uh, do this first. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, PCP uh, for your uh, support, and we need you. Uh, this is such a gargantuan uh, uh, task. It's, it's a war, uh, World War C, as they say. And uh, 
DOH cannot go it alone. Uh, that's why we have the IATF. Uh, this is a uh, whole of government uh, approach. But uh, beyond that, I think the call to action uh, applies to the whole of uh, society uh, approach. And uh, certainly the PCP is a uh, strategic uh, partner in uh, uh, improving uh, our uh, response. We believe that since the virus is a very young virus, it is a five month old virus, uh, a lot uh, has to, uh, uh, to be learned uh, about it. And uh, you certainly are a uh, rich uh, source of uh, information and that information will help influence uh, the policies and this, the decisions that uh, we will arrive at at the level of the interagency task force on uh, emerging infectious uh, diseases. And so uh, please do not doubt uh, at any point that uh, the DOH and the IATF will certainly seek you out uh, for uh, consultation and uh, for your take on uh, uh, the very dynamic uh, streams of uh, information uh, coming in, you know, by the minute, by the hour. And uh, certainly you will be able to help us uh, put clarity in this uh, uh, multitude of, uh, of uh, data that uh, uh, come in uh, for our guidance. So again, thank you very much uh, to uh, the PCP and all of its uh, officers and uh, members. So on behalf of the PCP Secretary, we would like to thank you for all of that you do to the DOH and everybody there, even the technical uh, committee. Thank you for leading and guiding and protecting the medical community and all of the Filipinos. It is indeed an honor to actually serve our country at this very time. Mabuhay kayo and uh, may God bless you. Uh, I'd like to just inform everybody that uh, this will be a series of webinars. So the next webinar will be on Friday, same time, 10 to 11.30. And um, the topic for Friday would be screening and detection, COVID-19 testing. So we will have um, a series of webinars that uh, will, will give you an in-depth knowledge of, of, of the topics that we have. So we usually have a representative from DOH and a representative from the uh, scientific community. So I uh, will give you uh, the link to the next webinar on Friday. Again, the webinar will be every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 to 11.30 p.m. As a a.m. pala, 10, uh, 10 to 11.30 a.m. So uh, thank you. Everyone, thank you to the to Secretary Duque, to Yusek Rosette, to um, to Beverly, and to Migo Mantaring. So uh, a lot of a lot of people are are in charge. There's a lot of back back end that that's been going around uh, just so that this webinar will will come into fruition. So we'd like to thank. Everybody from the OH, mabuhay po kayong lahat. Maraming salamat po sa lahat. Mabuhay din po kayo. Thank you po. Salamat po. Salamat. Thank you. The webinars will be, the this this has been recorded uh, and will be available Facebook Live but the, of the, uh, the Facebook page of the Philippine College of Physicians. If you want to uh, have, uh, if you, are, you have more questions, you can actually email uh, zoom.pcp at gmail.com. We will direct your questions to, to whoever uh, would answer. So we will direct your questions to DOH or the Technical Advisory Committee. Thank you so much. Maraming salamat po. Nice, Tom. Nakaka-nervous naman.